So uh, there's a lot of people suggesting that Counterintelligence 101 should be taught in journalism school from now on because a lot of uh, crazy shit is happening in regards to uh, stories breaking out regarding surveillance uh, on behalf of the government in the United States. There's been some prosecution of journalists going on. Uh, one journalist was recently prosecuted um, by the Department of Justice in what was called an overreaching prosecution. Come on. And um, there was a lot of uh, flack when Glenn Greenwald, a uh, US journalist working uh, for The Guardian in the UK, broke the story that Verizon is required to uh, give uh, metadata, that is circumstantial data, about its uh, hundreds of millions to c of customers to... Um, um, to um, uh, the NSA for, um, for, for data collection. And on top of that, a couple of days ago, there was another story regarding PRISM, which was a top secret NSA program that collects data straight from the servers of Facebook, Google, Yahoo, Apple, Skype, PalTalk, AOL, uh, and a lot of other companies. And all those stories broke within uh, a couple of weeks, uh, a month, max, from each other. And the last stories regarding the NSA all broke this week. And just a couple of hours ago, while I was grabbing lunch with my mother, um, another story broke out regarding, uh, also from Glenn Greenwald, who's been breaking all the NSA stories. Well, Glenn Greenwald uh, reveals his source, which is a gentleman called Edward Snowden, who uh, apparently used to work as a contractor for Bruce Allen Hamilton, and uh, with the CIA, with the NSA, sorry. And what he did, um, was he was able to, through his position, um, look at, uh, gather a lot of evidence regarding the surveillance that was happening, and he leaked that to uh, Glenn Greenwald, who worked with Laura Foitra, a filmmaker, to um, reveal himself and to maximize the effect effectiveness of his whistleblowing. So that being said, I think this is what's happening right now is really historic because we haven't had such a credible whistleblower. Uh, regarding government surveillance um, on such a scale for maybe even, I mean, maybe there's Bradley Manning, but Bradley Manning was more of a diplomatic foreign policy whistleblower. Uh, and so was Daniel Ellsberg. This is a, this is a very big whistleblower. And I, I, frankly, I'm not sure if we've had anything like this for the past 100 years. Um, you might be wondering whether this affects Canadians. It actually affects people around the world because a lot of the data that you use, so even if you're using Skype as a Canadian to talk to other Canadians, um, you're using Skype, your source is using Skype and you're building a story. And maybe, I mean, you as a lot of your students you wouldn't be doing this right now, but in the future when you're doing this, this data still goes through American servers and it's still subject to American jurisdiction. And through overreaches of the Patriot Act, Google uh, recently admitted that it has been forced to give data. There, there's a couple of chairs. Yeah. Hang on. Some chairs and chairs. There's a, uh, excuse me. There's a lot of prosecutorial overreach going on, and Google was forced to give data that was even in Europe to the US government through an overreach of the Patriot Act, which is kind of unrelated to what was going on right now with uh, uh, PRISM, the Internet Surveillance Program, and so on. So if you're using the internet as a Canadian, as a Brazilian, as a Ecuadorian, you're likely using American services because a lot of businesses, everything from Facebook to Skype to Apple to Google to Yahoo to AOL to PalTalk, um, is located to some extent, or even totally, in the United States, or has an administration, a central administration that is located in the United States and can still be coerced to apply surveillance laws. So, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I work for the um, New America Foundation, which is a nonprofit think tank, political think tank. They fund my work, but I, I, what I actually do is work on a project called CryptoCat, which is a uh, Experimental encrypted messaging solution. It's used by, um, I would say, like a liberal estimate would be 
more than 100,000 uh, people around the world every month, but I would say more like 60 to 80,000 people every month right now. It encrypts your conversations. I'll be talking more about it later, but that's who I am. I'm here because of the Open Internet Tools Project at the New America Foundation. I'm contractually required to say that uh, so that they'll pay me. But uh, cool, we'll be talking today about how to anonymize your internet connection. So when you're visiting a website, the website you're visiting doesn't know your IP address, who you are. They can't identify who you are. Uh, your internet service provider, the, the company that gives you internet, Bell, Rogers, doesn't know which website you're visiting. And you can also, in case you're in like some um, awful internet censorship regime, you can circumvent internet censorship. But thankfully, that's largely, mostly, not entirely, not the case in Canada. We'll be also talking about how you can secure your communications when you're communicating with sources using encryption. You can encrypt the data you're transmitting with, uh, with sources so that when you're talking to them, you can uh, send files in an encrypted fashion, send emails in an encrypted fashion, have inst encrypted instant messaging conversations. And that means that even if those messages are intercepted, they cannot be read because they're encrypted. So that's another cool thing you can do in case you're wondering, uh, you want to be a journalist and you want to be able to talk to a source. Um, and the third thing we're going to talk about is disk encryption. I see a lot of you use Macs, so that's kind of easier on Macs, although there are many solutions and some of them are open source software, which is better because it means that the software is free and available for public scrutiny and study. And uh, finally, the thing I'll start with actually is uh, security culture which is really important because there is this misconception that's happening that if you use security software, then you're perfectly safe. Uh, if you use uh, encryption, then parabolic microphones don't work. Well, what's happening in Syria is that a lot of people use encryption software, and a lot of people use Skype, which is disastrous, but uh, a lot of people use encryption software, but they still they have key loggers inside their keyboards that were installed while they were away. They have software key loggers that they downloaded because they downloaded a PDF that said names of wanted Syrian rebel members that turned out to be a computer virus that infected them with a program that logs their keystrokes and send them back to a government, a Syrian government server. This, this happens all the time, by the way. It sounds like something from Blade Runner. It's kind of cool, but really it kills people. Um, and there's also uh, a lot of very interesting things that they're doing is that when you're talking over Skype, you're, you know, you're using your voice and you're talking. And um, they set up parabolic microphones on the other side of the build, uh, on another building, sorry, and they just monitor everything you're saying. So like, even if you're using super ultra unbreakable encryption, you're totally screwed. So this is why security culture is really important because when you use those tools, when you use Tor, the tool that lets you visit websites uh, without being tracked or, or visit websites um, anonymously and privately without people knowing which websites you're visiting is really helpful and really awesome. It's been in development for 10 years, but it stops there. So if you go through Tor and you log in to myrealname at gmail.com with the password, this is my real name, and send an email to everyone saying, hey, I'm using Tor and my name is uh, Nadim and I'm located in Montreal, then you're not securing yourself at all. And this is where the software stops working. This is why you need to adopt a security culture that uh, teaches you um, how to trust computers, how to trust sources, how to operate on a need-to-know basis. And this is with the hopes that one of those days you'll break a story as great as the one that Grant Greenwald just broke about um, Edward Snowden. Uh, this is not for a regular journalist. I, I understand if you're covering the tremendously boring Formula One uh, thing that's happening in Montreal right now. Uh, you will probably not need this, but this is with the hopes that you will do something more productive with your careers. So um, uh, let's, let, let's cover just some pointers about security culture. So when you're talking with a source, you have to have basic standards about communication, about protecting the source from themselves because they might want to reveal, they might be uh, uninitiated or naive, they might, they might want to reveal more about themselves than they, than they should. Uh, you want to keep it so that you are, not legally, uh, you are not more legally liable than they are and they are not more legally liable than they should be. So identifying the source should only come as something that you do after. You should receive the documentation, vet it, if you can publish stuff and verify its authenticity without, without necessarily verifying who the source is, this is how WikiLeaks operated for a long time. And so this is something that you can do 
You can publish information as long as you can reasonably verify if it's authentic without, without needing to really uh, obtain the name of the source because that holds you legally liable to an investigation, which is not something you want. You just want to do good journalism. Um, there's also um, a lot of things that play into that, such as a need-to-know basis so that you publish uh, carefully. Actually, I should just go and stay with the tools. This is, this is pointless. Um, we're going to start with Tor. So, do you all have the internet connection ready? Yeah. Cool. Is, is, are we supposed to plug into NSA? It's no working. Yes. Oh, wait, it's not? No. Yeah, it works. It this is the username and yeah, it's probably a Windows thing. No, he's using a Mac. I'm are, using are Windows. Oh, it's sorry. just a white. <laughs> <laughs> There's one over there. Um, it's not working? 13 ones. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you a Concordia student? Uh, I can log in to something. Please try. Yeah. Does anyone have a USB key? To either one, right? If you cannot log into the internet, which at this point I'm not willing to play with because it took a bit of luck to fix it up, um, I'm sorry, but we can. What we can do is that we can use a USB stick to transfer files that we'll be downloading, and so you can sort of use them. If someone has a USB drive that they're willing to lend me, because I don't have one right now. Thank you. Do you have anything sensitive on it? Do you want to delete some stuff on it? Okay, thank you. So Tor, OK, so first, a primer on what security software to trust. There's a lot of security software out there. There's a lot of people who say that their security software is military-grade encrypted, which is bullshit. And um, even Skype says that it's end-to-end -end encrypted. But Skype is actually being surveyed. And this is something that security researchers um, systematically, scientifically probe just very recently, um, even though it uses encryption. Why is that? Because the encryption used in Skype, first, it's, propri it's proprietary. Proprietary. I'm not sure how to say that word. Proprietary? Proprietary. Okay. I usually type it. But, uh, it's proprietary, and that means that the people who made it kept the source code and the methodology closed. No one knows how Skype really works, except the people who made it. It's not available for public review from other researchers or from activists or journalists or, any or anyone else really other than Skype. And that means that Skype controls when the encryption works and when it doesn't and how it works and who gets encrypted data and who doesn't. And the end result is that Skype ends up providing a lot of information to governments. As we can see, they were part of the PRISM program that, was, that the whistleblower uh, Edward Snowden revealed recently. Um, there are other programs like that, like Wicker and uh, Snapchat, who work with, with, with the same basis, and also BlackBerry Messenger. So BlackBerry Messenger is banned in many countries, and so is Viber. Uh, Viber is banned in Saudi Arabia, for example. It was banned recently. But strangely enough, um, BlackBerry Messenger was threatened with being banned in Saudi Arabia, but, and, but after it wasn't. Like, after it was threatened, Saudi Arabia did not ban it after all. That's because BlackBerry Messenger uses an a proprietary encryption system that has a set key, and that key can be given to governments at their request. And uh, RIM does that to preserve business. So this is why you shouldn't trust uh, proprietary encryption systems. On the other end, we have open source encryption systems, open source security software. And that's software that's made by similarly competent people, usually academics and researchers. But the difference is that it's published as open source software. So what, en what ends up happening is that you have, the you have the software available for public review. All of the encryption techniques are available for public review. All of the code is available for scrutiny. And that is extremely important. That is extremely important because every single piece of substantial or useful encryption software that's been published in my memory for the past, ever since I've been in this field, as open source software has had bugs in it, security bugs, security flaws, revealed and fixed regularly, once every few months. And this is something that happens because encryption is extremely difficult and because even if your encryption and security part of your code and your research is flawless, a bug in the user interface can grant a hacker access over your data still and access to break your encryption. So making the software is really hard. And that's why you need to trust only software that's open source and publicly reviewed. And that also, when, when you have software that's open source and publicly reviewed, 
It also means that the software is safe from being backdoored, from being uh, selectively, so a backdoor means that you have third party entities or the developer himself installing um, sort of illegitimate entries into the code or into, in, into your data that only they can access or only the government can access. The FBI is currently pushing for a program in the United States called the Going Dark Program, which would mean that all websites, web, web applications, and encryption software would have to have a government mandated backdoor or else they would be illegal. Uh, and all, this is also known as Kalea in the United States. So this was the case for a while, uh, way back. Um, Gmail had a government mandated backdoor. And then what ended up happening was that the Chinese um, uh, hackers in China, probably the Chinese military, ended up accessing that, that backdoor that was meant for the United States to spy on US senators, Gmail accounts. So when you have those things, they're not really, you can't just break security for one person. If you break security, you break it for everyone. And this is something that you have to know. When you're using proprietary software, when you're using Gmail, Facebook, Skype, all of those softwares that do have a set of security mechanisms that serve a particular purpose. That purpose is limited on purpose. Sorry for the repetitive phrasing. Um, because of legal pressures, uh, national security pressures, and so on. And so I'm just going to write a simple list here of uh, open source software that I trust. And so you might want to copy it down for later use. But we'll go through a lot of the software now. So in terms of privacy and anonymity, browsing the internet and, and censorship circumvention, there's one software that's better than everything else. It's called Tor. That's, that's the only thing you need. It's developed by the best people in the field, actually. Um, in terms of instant messaging encrypted chat on your phone, so like you know Google Talk basically, but on your phone that's encrypted. And encrypted means that even the, because it's open source, even the people who made the software can't see what you what you're chatting because it's open source, because the code behind it is publicly reviewed. People can verify whether the developers are being honest. People can audit the software themselves. And because of this, the software is trustworthy. So on Android, I would go with Gibberbot for IM, TextSecure for, for uh, encrypted SMS messaging, and uh, Redphone for encrypted calls you know, voice calls, regular calls that are encrypted on, but these are all only for Android. For iPhone, there's Chat Secure, which is uh, sim very similar to Gibberbot, but for the iPhone. For your desktop, uh, encrypted communications, there's OTR, and OTR is basically a plugin that works with a lot of programs. So it works, uh, how many, do you know Pigeon? Any of you have heard of Pigeon before? Cool, so you can just plug it into Pigeon and it works as a plugin straight from there. It, it encrypts your conversations with anyone else who's using OTR, either in Pigeon or in another program. Adium, the uh, Mac instant messaging program, comes with OTR built in, which is really amazing. I wish Pigeon did that. So OTR comes in Pigeon, Adium, and also in CryptoCat, which is what I work on, and it's the browser version of OTR. I'll talk more about those three later. For um, disk encryption, so just a, just a brief primer on disk encryption. With disk encryption, you can be tempted to make like an encrypted container on your hard disk. So you have like a file that you can decrypt and then there's like, uh, or, or an encrypted folder and there's files inside. This is easily breakable. The thing you have to do is encrypt your entire hard disk, otherwise, uh, it's called full disk encryption. And that means that every single sector, every single bit on your hard disk, every physical bit on your hard disk is encrypted. And so that means if your laptop is stolen, your hard disk is taken out, plugged into another computer, none of it is readable. If you encrypt just a single folder, what happens usually is that, um, so for example, this is one thing that can happen, although there's a lot more attacks. Um, sometimes when you use your computer and you don't have a lot of RAM uh, memory, your computer ends up using part of your hard disk as memory. And when that happens, sometimes your encryption keys get stored on your hard disk because your hard disk is being used for memory. And that can be recovered and decrypted your encrypted folder. So that's really bad. That's actually what happened to an activist that I know. He was a terrible activist. No? But no, he was really awful. But um, 
terrible person. <laughs> so I would recommend, so on Mac, there's a proprietary, pro proprietary um, encryption system called File Vault 2. It's only on 10 point like Lion and higher. I think 10.7 and higher. But it's proprietary, so you might not want to trust it very much. However, unfortunately, it's the only like worthwhile one in terms of full disk encryption that's available on Macs. I, I personally, maybe there's another, but I personally don't know of it. Um, an open source one is called TrueCrypt. It's for Windows, TrueCrypt does full disk encryption only on Windows. On Mac, it only encrypts folders, which is useful, I guess. But on Windows, it does full disk encryption. So can you see? OK, yeah, it's visible. So I guess that's all I'll be covering today. I'll be going through those tools. Which one do you want to start with first? You pick. Who wants to go with Tor first? Tor. Yeah, sure. Okay. Tor. Um, so please go to torproject.org. Uh, I was given a USB drive, so I'll pass around the download. So just go to torproject.org. You should get this website. And just click on download Tor. And then download browser bundle for Mac. It's very easy. Tor used to be really hard to use, but they made it really easy recently. So let me explain how Tor works. Um, I think the Electronic Frontier Foundation made a nice graph. Today, yeah. Oh no, you saw it on Hacker News today, or on Reddit today, but they made it a long time ago. Okay. Was it Hacker News? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you use Hacker? Awesome. We should hang out later. Um, okay, so, oh, there's more than that. Sorry, just a second. There's more than one. It's a series of graphs. This? Yeah, this is the one that was a hacker. I'll show, I'll, I need to show another one first, because that, that, one, that one doesn't explain how relays work. It just explains no, who can see like, what. Yeah. But I'll, I'll show it in a bit. Just let me show this one first. OK. So usually, when you connect to a website, this is you, you're Alice, you're connecting to dave.com. OK? Um, what happens, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. And this actually doesn't show what I want to show. Wait, give me a second. Well, for, for, all intents, for all intents and purposes. You usually connect directly, and your IP address is seen by the website. Your internet service provider, Bell, Videotron, uh, sees that you're connecting to the website. And if the website is censored, then too bad. They can censor it for you, and they won't let you connect to the website. When you use Tor, uh, Tor <coughs> is basically a piece of software that connects to a network run by volunteers. Like people like you and me, I run a Tor node. And what a Tor node is, is so those computers with the plus sign are a Tor node. It's just a, it's just a computer that connects and becomes part of the Tor network. And it will pass data back and forth for Tor users, just like out of charity. It, it usually ends up using a lot of bandwidth. But what happens is that instead of direct, instead of connecting directly to the, to the website, to Dave.com, Alice will, will hop through a random set of Tor nodes split all around the world through <coughs> different connections. So she will connect to this computer, right? And the ISP, Bell or, 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 or Rogers, will see not that she connected to Dave.com, but that she connected, or in, in this case, she tried to connect to Bob.com. The ISP will see that she connected to random computers somewhere around the world that's a Tor node. Right? And so this Tor node will connect to another Tor node. Mind you, not Alice, but this Tor node itself. will connect to another Tor node, and this Tor node will connect to another Tor node, and all of these are random around the world, all through encrypted connections. And that last Tor node will actually connect to the website itself. It doesn't, that Tor node doesn't even know who Alice is. It doesn't, even the Tor node itself doesn't know who's requesting the website, right? Unless Alice sends identifying information. In which case, the Tor nodes can intercept that. Um, and then, you know, connects to Bob through an unencrypted link, because the website usually is accessible through HTTP, and sends the information back. 
And that's how Twill works. And so because of this, because of this, you end up circumventing censorship because you're not connecting to the website directly, so your ISP doesn't know that you're accessing the website that you're meant to be accessing. And you end up protecting your identity because jane.com or bob.com ends up seeing not you connecting, but a random Tor node. And the connection is encrypted. So, any questions? Yeah. Yes. Seeing someone who's got a lot of time and willingness and a lot of natural intelligence, they'd be able to backtrack all these node connections? Oh, absolutely. For so, sure. So then, uh, with your answer then, it doesn't seem like it's totally, totally private and totally secure. No, I never said that. <laughs> okay, good. You just want to that. <laughs> well, how, then, then how, how, what would you, you, you mentioned Tor as being one of your best. It is, in fact, one of the best. Okay, so what, at what level of security do you put it at? Okay, so I would say the best security is not secure. There is no such thing as complete security that has never been achieved in computer science or in computer security or in information security or internet security or privacy technologies ever or encryption technologies. Encryption technologies are made to last until someone comes up that has enough time to break them. That's basically the state of situations for me, for you, for the US government, for militaries, for anyone around the world, for the most classified Chinese data. There is no such thing as unbreakable security. This is not totally secure. Now, when it comes to someone um, backtracking these connections, it's not as easy, like I couldn't do it personally. But that's, that's not because it's impossible, it's because it's hard and not skilled enough. And I don't even know a lot of people that are skilled enough to do it. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible because the reason we've come so far is exactly because everything prior has been broken. And the reason we will progress as an uh, internet uh, uh, security community is because this will be broken too. And this is the way this stuff works. And this is why, this is exactly why open source software is important and open source methodologies are important. Because if this stuff was proprietary, we would never be able to figure out how to break it in the first place, and therefore we would not be able to progress. And that's how this field works. But thank you. Uh, but right now, I mean, this is the state of scientific research. I mean, if we were, see, if we were selling it to you, I would be telling you otherwise, right? But we're not, we're not making money out of this, or at least tourism. You're not. Tour is very slow. So what can we do? Uh, there was a version that was released recently with a patch that was submitted by Ian Goldberg, Canadian scientist, that uh, significantly increased the speeds of Tor. However, Tor will remain significantly slower than regular internet connections until the end of time because of how it works, right? Because un uh, instead of connecting to directly to another server, you're connecting through, like, I don't know how many nodes, and, like, you're jumping, like, Sweden, Egypt, and Tark, like, I don't, well, there's only, I don't think there's Tor nodes. You know, Turkey, Australia. U.S., France, U.S., France, U.S., France, U.S., France, Canada. And so there's like a lot of jumps on Tor nodes that are volunteer run, oversaturated with connections. I mean, a lot of people use Tor for porn, right? I mean, it's actually like a, a couple of studies showed that it's like the number one use for Tor. <laughs> and it's really sad because, I mean, there's more people who want better things to do with Tor than porn. But... <laughs> That's why it's slow. Honestly, from my understanding of Tor, which is very limited, I don't think it's going to get any faster anytime soon. Or, you know, maybe it'll get progressively faster. Like in five years, it'll be like 10% faster. But like, I don't imagine anything more than that. That's just like an estimate figure, obviously. So did you all download Tor through my long-winded talk about Tor? Is it on all of your computers? You all have Tor? Please raise your hands. Come on. I cannot operate without feedback. Okay. Oh, cool. That's wonderful. Please open your Tor download, which I will put on a USB drive for the poor guy who's waiting. Here <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable passing all your data to other people randomly for, for a download. You have a lot of data on this thing. Does anyone have a clean USB stick with nothing on it? Well, you can use that if you draw. Use what? There is one, but it's just a second. Thanks.
Millions of years later, the computer recognized the USB drive. <laughs> the elders of the town rejoiced as their wait finally came to an end. <laughs> Young men and women who had only heard of the USB drive in legend finally saw it come to life <laughs> as the MacBook recognized it and Nadim copied the Tor download. The sky split and the face of Mufasa came. It spoke, listen to me Simba, this USB drive is yeah. fucked up. It's not working. <laughs> also, <coughs> well, any other guesses as to how we can get this extremely basic piece of technology to work? So is, is everybody at Avid except one? Who doesn't have it? I figured it out. Okay. Who the, is I'm the only one who doesn't have it? Okay. Yeah, I have it. Okay, you have it. Yeah. No. So everybody has it. Just yeah. So we don't need. That's fine. That's fine, man. That's wonderful. Yeah, just fine now. <laughs> cool. So we all have the software. Please open the zip file. You will get the cool icon. It looks like this. You all have this icon. Yes? Um, this icon. Yes. Come on, guys. Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. So, open. <coughs> when you open this, you'll get Tor itself, uh, which my firewall needs to give access to. And it'll connect to Tor. This is, this is the interface for Tor, for Tor called Vidalia. It's connecting to the Tor <coughs> network. When it connects to the Tor network, the Tor browser, which is based on Firefox, it's basically Firefox is slightly modified, will launch and will give you this page that says, congratulations, you are connected to use, you're configured to use Tor. Your IP address appears to be 3117233. This is the IP address that people will see when you're using Tor as your IP address. However, my IP address is actually this. And if we geolocate this IP address, we will see that my actual IP address, the real one when I'm not using Tor, what is this nonsense? I'll just use my own. Is, you know, Canada, Quebec, right? It's the, it's the real one. So when we use the one that appears to others when we're using Tor, this is the IP address of this guy. This is his IP address that we're seeing. And when we see where it traces back to, it's going to say anonymous proxy in <laughs> which I assume is German. Let's get another identity. Use another identity. I just changed my identity and now to websites that will appear as someone else. See, my IP address just changed. And now to the internet, I am an, another German from Net Cologne, the most nicely smelling internet service provider. <laughs> and to use another IP address, I just want to get another country in Germany, hopefully. There's a lot of nerds in Germany. Oh, OVH, that's uh, French. A French service provider. We're really good, actually. Okay, so Tor is working. Now I can browse the internet using Tor. So I just go to shadywebsite.org. <laughs> well, you know, someone was smart enough to get that domain. <laughs> but so actually, it's uh, surprisingly fast right now. So let's go to, I don't know, uh, CNN.com. Let's see just how, it's, it's kind of slow, but really it's been, like I remember using Tor in 2005 and in that boy wasn't really slow back then. It was much slower than it is now. So it takes a while. Notice that uh, the Tor <coughs> browser has like some extra plugins added to it from Firefox that like makes sure you use HTTPS all the time. Whoa, see, that's, uh, 
That's the guy I was talking about, the, 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 the whistleblower. So see, I'm not crazy or if I know it's schizophrenic. He's actually on the front page of CNN. And he's a hero. He's amazing. The computer technician for a defense contractor leaked the details of a top secret US program that sifted through telecom data American and British newspapers revealed. This is what we're here for. Hey, Kovac. How's it going? Um, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this workshop. So do you want to watch the video? Are you guys interested in seeing what he has to say? I think it would be like yeah. cool to watch it, actually, mm -hmm. if you have time. I'm just going to open up my regular browser so it's faster. I mean, it's CNN, it's shitty coverage, but whatever. Well, if you go to Guardian, you'll have to flip Yeah, yeah, let's go to Guardian. Guardian, 12 minutes. I don't know. I don't Oh, of course it will be on the front page. What am I thinking? Or actually on YouTube, it'll be faster. It's the same one. Oh, whoops. The YouTube link somehow... Okay, we'll put it in. The server is pretty fast. It's really good. And this is history, by the way. My name is Ed Snowden. I'm 29 years old. I work for Lewis Allen Hamilton as an infrastructure analyst for NSA uh, in Hawaii. <coughs> what are some of the positions that you held previously within the intelligence community? Uh, I've been uh, a systems engineer, system administrator, uh, senior advisor uh, for the uh, Central Intelligence Agency Solutions Consultant and a uh, telecommunications information systems officer. One of the things people are going to be most interested in, 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 in trying to understand what <coughs> you are and, and what you're thinking is there came some point in time when you crossed this line of thinking about being a whistleblower um, to making the choice to actually become a whistleblower. Walk people through that decision-making process. Uh, when you're in positions of, of privileged access, like a, a systems administrator for these sort of intelligence community agencies, you're exposed to a lot more information on a broader scale than the average employee. And because of that, you see things that uh, may be disturbing, but uh, over the course of a normal person's career, you'd only see one or two of these instances. Uh, when you see everything, you see them on a more frequent basis, and you recognize that some of these things are actually abuses, and when you talk to people about them, uh, in a place like this where this is the, the normal state of business, people tend not to take them very seriously and you know, move on from them. But over time, that awareness of wrongdoing sort of builds up. And you feel compelled to talk about it. And the more you talk about it, the more you're ignored, the more you're told it's not a problem. Until eventually you realize that uh, these things need to be determined by the public, not by somebody who's simply hired by the government. Talk a little bit about how the American surveillance state actually functions. It, uh, does it target the actions of Americans? Uh, NSA, in the intelligence community in general, uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can, by any means possible, that it believes on the grounds of sort of a self-certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, originally, we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now, increasingly, we see that it's happening domestically. And to do that, they, uh, the NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system, and it filters them, and it analyzes them, and it measures them, and it stores them for periods of time simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. So while they may uh, be intending to uh, target someone associated with a foreign government or someone that they suspect of terrorism, they're collecting your communications to do so. Uh, any analyst of any time can target anyone, uh, any selector anywhere. Where those uh, communications will be picked up depends on the range of the sensor networks and the authorities that that analyst is uh, empowered with. Not all analysts have the ability to target everything. But I, sitting at my desk, uh, certainly had the authorities to, to wiretap anyone, from you or your accountant to a federal judge to even the president if I had a personal email. One of the extraordinary parts about this episode is that usually whistleblowers 
do what they do anonymously and take steps to remain anonymous for as long as they can, which they hope often is forever. You, on the other hand, have decided to do the opposite, which is to declare yourself openly as the person behind these disclosures. Why did you choose to do that? I, I think that the public is owed an explanation of the motivations behind the people who make these disclosures that are outside of the democratic model. When you are subverting the power of government, that, that's a fundamentally dangerous thing to democracy. And if you do that in secret consistently, you know, as the government does uh, when it wants to benefit from that secret action that it took, uh, it'll kind of give its, its officials a mandate to go, hey, you know, tell the press about this thing and that thing so the public is on our side. But they rarely, if ever, do that when an abuse occurs. That falls to uh, individual citizens but they're typically maligned. You know, it, it becomes a thing of these people are against the country, they're against the government. But I'm not. I'm, I'm no different from anybody else. Uh, I don't have special skills. Uh, I, I'm just another guy who sits there day to day in the office, watches what happen, what's happening, and goes, this is something that's not our place to decide. The public needs to decide whether these programs and policies are right or wrong. And I'm willing to go on the record to defend the authenticity of them and say, I didn't change these. I didn't modify the story. This is the truth. This is what's happening. You should decide whether we need to be doing this. Have you given thought to what it is that the US government's response to your conduct is in terms of what they might say about you, how they might try to depict you, what they might try to do to you? Uh, yeah, I, I could be, you know, rendered by the CIA. I, I could have uh, people come after me or any of their, their third-party partners. Uh, you know, they, they work closely with a number of other nations. Uh, or, you know, they could pay off the triads or, you know, any any if their agents or assets. Uh, we've, we've got a CIA station just up the road in uh, the, the consulate here in Hong Kong. Uh, and I'm sure they're going to be uh, very busy for the next week. Um, and that's, that's a, a fear I'll live under for the rest of my life, however long that happens to be. You, you can't come forward against the world's most powerful intelligence agencies and uh, be completely free from risk because they're such powerful adversaries that, that no one can meaningfully oppose them. Um, if they want to get you, they'll get you in time. But at the same time, you have to make a determination about what it is that's important to you. And if living, uh, living unfreely but comfortably is something you're willing to accept, and I think many of us are, it's, it's the human nature, uh, you can get up every day, you can go to work, you can collect your, your large paycheck for relatively little work uh, against the public interest and, and go to sleep at night after watching uh, your shows. But if you realize that that's the world that you helped create, and it's going to get worse with the next generation and the next generation who extend the capabilities of this sort of architecture of oppression, uh, you realize that you might be willing to accept any risk. And it doesn't matter what the outcome is, so long as the public gets to make their own decisions about how that's applied. Why should people care about surveillance? Because even if you're not doing anything wrong, you're being watched and recorded. And the, the storage capability of these systems increases every year consistently by orders of magnitude uh, to where it's getting to the point you don't have to have done anything wrong. You simply have to eventually fall under suspicion from somebody, even by a wrong call. And then they can use the system to go back in time and scrutinize every decision you've ever made, every friend you've ever discussed something with, and attack you on that basis to sort of derive suspicion from an innocent life and paint anyone in the context of a wrongdoer. We are currently sitting in a room in, in Hong Kong, which is where we are because you traveled here. Talk a little bit about why it is that you came here. And specifically, there are going to be people who will speculate um, that what you really intend to do is to defect to the country that many see as the number one rival of the United States which is China, and that what you're really doing is essentially seeking to aid an enemy of the United States with which you intend to um, seek asylum. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So there, there's a couple of uh, assertions in, in those arguments um, that, are, that are sort of embedded in the, the questioning of the choice of Hong Kong. Uh, 
The first is that China is an enemy of the United States. It, it's not. I mean, there, there are conflicts between the United States government and the Chinese uh, PRC government. But the, the peoples inherently, you know, we, we don't care. We trade with each other freely. You know, we're not at war. We're not uh, in armed conflict. And we're not trying to be. We're, we're the largest trading partners out there for each other. Um, uh, additionally, Hong Kong uh, has a strong tradition of free speech. Uh, people think, oh, China, great firewall. Mainland China does have significant restrictions uh, on free speech. But uh, the Hong Kong, the people of Hong Kong, uh, have a long tradition of protesting in the streets, of uh, making their views known. The internet is not filtered here, um, no more so than any other Western government. And I believe that the uh, Hong Kong government is actually independent uh, in relation to a lot of other leading Western governments. If your motive had been to harm the United States and help its enemies, or if your motive had been personal and material gain, were there things that you could have done with these documents um, to advance those goals that you didn't end up doing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, anybody in the positions of access with the te technical uh, capabilities that I had could, you know, suck out secrets, pass them on the open market to Russia. You know, they always have an open door, as we do. Um, I had access to, you know, the, the full rosters of everyone working at the NSA, the entire intelligence community, uh, and undercover assets all around the world, uh, the locations of every station uh, we have, what their missions are, and so forth. Uh, if I had just wanted to harm the U.S., you know, that you could shut down the, the surveillance system in an afternoon, um, but that's not my intention. And I, I think for anyone um, making that argument, they need to think, if they were in my position, uh, and you know, you live a privileged life, you, you're living in Hawaii, in, in paradise, and making a ton of money, what would it take to make you leave everything behind? The, the greatest fear that I have regarding um, the outcome uh, for America of these disclosures is that nothing will change. Um, people will see in the media uh, all of these disclosures. They'll know the lengths that the, the government is going to grant themselves powers unilaterally um, to create greater control over American society and global society. But they, they won't be willing to take the risks necessarily to stand up and fight to change things, to force their representatives to actually take a stand in their interests. Uh, and the months ahead, the, the years ahead, it's only going to get worse until eventually there will be a time where uh, policies will change. Because the only thing that restricts the activities of the surveillance state our policy. Uh, even our agreements with, with other sovereign governments, we consider that to be uh, a stipulation of policy rather than a stipulation of law. And because of that, a new leader will be elected. They'll flip the switch, uh, say that um, because of the crisis, because of the dangers that we face in the world, you know, some, some new and unpredicted threat. We need more authority. We need more power. And there will be nothing that people can do at that point to oppose it. Uh, and it will be turned to keep tyranny. Well, there you go. So the situation right now is that some like weird hacker film matrix style business is going on. This is historic. And this only happened like uh, for people who haven't seen this before. This came out uh, four hours ago now? Yeah. 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 Four hours ago. Uh, after all the leaks, this is the guy that leaked the prism thing, the ones I introduced uh, this workshop with. And I did not know this when I organized the workshop that it was this bad, but it is this bad. And this guy, you know what's the, th the thing about him is that he, usually computer hackers, uh, internet activists, are very outspoken. They're, to a certain degree, antisocial. And uh, they, they're not politically and socially measured, highly eloquent, clean cut, extremely intelligent, and sane 
white males like this guy. He's 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 the worst thing that could possibly happen to the NSA at this point. Which is, I mean, I can't imagine a quality about him that would make him even slightly suspect to illegitimacy when it came. He gave a, he gave the reporters his passport, his social security number, and everything in between. Thank you a lot. This was like a godsend. It's really nice. I should buy one of those. Um, so this is why we're here. Um, I understand that this is like, even for me, who, I mean, I, I, I'm an information security guy by trade, right? I'm a computer security guy by trade. And I find this hard to believe. Maybe because I understand the implications more or in a different way. But still, what this means is that by the time you guys have children, or if you have children already who are going to school soon, and they want to be journalists, you, bet you better put them in a school that teaches counterintelligence as part of journalism, because otherwise, they are going, you're going to spend a lot of, they're going to have a lot of student loans on tuition for nothing, because the landscape is really changing. The way the internet, I mean, the internet didn't only change content delivery, but it changes what it is that can ruin your job and what it is that can ruin your uh, story, what it is that can, that can ruin your professional integrity, what it, what it is that can ruin your life, and what it is that can create the relationship that you need not only between your readers, but also between your sources and your coworkers, right? Usually people thought of the internet as a new delivery mechanism, you just worry about how you deliver your content, but the implications are far wider. I mean, maybe what I'm stating is obvious, but it's still like I'm kind of shocked by this, to be honest. Still, even though all the leaks have happened, it's still really, to me, I have never seen something like this, or never thought that I would see anything like this in my life, what this guy is doing. And I've been through WikiLeaks and all. Um, all right, so I've showed you how to use Tor. Uh, you can also use Tor with other programs, by the way. It's not just the browser. So the browser that launches is just here for ease of use. It's meant to make it easy to use Tor. But you can also connect other programs, because Tor is actually a proxy. So if we look into this browser's uh, settings, if we go into like tools, uh, it's Firefox, by the way. This is just Firefox cleverly disguised as Tor browser. Um, if we go to um, preferences, and then we go to, like, we check the network settings, advanced network settings, we see that it's configured to use a SOX proxy. This is what connects the Tor browser to Tor, the, the client on your computer, which then connects to the Tor network, which is a bunch of volunteer nodes, right? <coughs> it's connected to, it's, it's very small and it's hard to enlarge because of Firefox, but I'm going to just write it again here. Any pe when, you, when you're running Tor in Tor Browser, any other piece of software that you configure to use these settings, will also be using, will also be working through the Tor network. You will benefit from all the encryption and safety of the Tor network. Just make sure Tor is running and that you configure your SOX. It's called SOX 5. Usually when you go into network settings of any program you're using, uh, ADM works that way. Um, Pigeon works that way. Your all browsers except for Chrome work that way. Um, you, can, fuck, you, can, you, can, you can configure World of Warcraft to work that way. You can play, I mean, it would be a horrible experience, but because <laughs> it's really slow, but I mean, just a lot of programs work that way. Just any program that supports SOX 5. But you have to be careful, as I said before, that last node, the exit node on the Tor network, remember this? The thing I showed you, um, this graph. This one, right? The one that connects for you straight to the server, right? This one can see your content, right? And this one can see not only your content, but the content that you're receiving from the server as well. They don't know who you are. They don't know your identity, but they can see what you're, what you're talking about. And just a volunteer, I can run an exit node right now, and we can spy on people. That's a copy maker. Oh. <laughs> 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 and, no, it is. It's, it's when they say spying. Food. The name of Edward Snowden will be erased. Coffee makers unite! <laughs> All coffee makers are secret. Never mind. <laughs> really I'm usually funnier than this. Um, so, right. So this thing sees everything unencrypted. It doesn't know who you are. But that means that you have to be careful what you send to Tor. Because I know a lot of assholes, right, who run through, the, who run these exit nodes and just spy on everything. And they usually end up with a very good rate guessing who the person is. Because that person um, logs into an unencrypted. So just a quick thing, right? If a website has this thing, 
HTTPS, it is much better than a website not having this thing, HTTPS, usually like HTTP, like for example, this website. Because it means, uh, it doesn't show, but like, you know, HTTPS, this log icon. What that means is that your connection between you and the website is encrypted. So uh, my connection to uh, torproject.org right now is encrypted. But the torproject.org server, like the website, can, can read everything. They can see who I am. It's not anonymized or anything. But between me and torproject.org, everything is anonymous. OK? Oh, damn it. Everything is encrypted. Sorry. Scratch that. Um, but the website itself is, uh, is able to see, uh, is able to read the request. But this is still much better. This is really like whenever you're logging into something, you're logging into PayPal, you're logging into Gmail, anything that requires a login, please make sure that you have HTTPS enabled. Because if you don't, then anyone can see your login information in the clear. Anyone other than just PayPal. Because your PayPal is meant to see it, right? But um, you, know, you don't want your ISP to see it, if, or the government to see it. If it's not using HTTPS and you log into a website or you pass your credit card information or any data at all, this data will be intercepted for sure. It's intercepted. That, like, it's very easy to do that. Um, and the web, the web by default operates without HTTPS at all, except for Microsoft. Uh, sorry, wait. Uh, Google and Facebook recently started using HTTPS everywhere uh, on all of their website all the time, I think, as well as Twitter and a bunch of other services. Uh, that's all I know. But quick question: So if you click on a link, please feel Google. free to ask questions anytime. By the way, yes. uh, if you click on a link in Google, like you do a search and you, uh, something comes up, when you go to that that link, will it be an HTTP? No, HTTP but your Google search will be. Okay. Um, Google uh, only started doing this by default this year. This didn't used to be the case, and it's it's a really welcome step. How how reliable is the HTTPS? Because I, I don't know if I'm making this up, but I heard but Gmail was using HTTPS but not actually providing the service. OK. So if you connect through HTTPS and you see the thing, especially on Google Chrome, because the implementation there is much safer, then you have a secure connection. That for, for A, that's for sure. So your connection between you and Gmail, for example, is encrypted. That doesn't mean that your data is encrypted from Gmail or Google themselves. They can still see what's going on, but your ISP likely cannot. However. There are many flaws which date with the HTTPS system that really make it very broken. And those flaws have been exploited in Syria and in Iran to ruin activists' lives. So they're very serious. What happens is that when you have a website, when I have uh, Nadeem.com, right? And I want to get an HTTPS uh, system running, I have to get something called a certificate, a security certificate. And those certificates verify the authenticity of me and Nadeem.com as really Nadeem.com, Nadeem's website, right? And this is a necessary step because um, a part of security is authentication in, in the context of SSL and HTTPS. And the way that's done is fundamentally broken because the way we've uh, decided to do it, the way engineers before me decided to do it, was have a bunch of certificate authorities set up all over the world by like business people and you pay them $20 and they verify who you are. Except for two things. First, all of them will just send you, a lot of them will just send you the thing automatically without verifying it. We're barely, I can get HTTPS certificates for any website just by an email verification. So that's really bad. And second, uh, what they're, they're all getting hacked. So Turk Trust got hacked and then all of like Turkey was uh, subject to an HTTPS man in the middle. They faked the security certificates for Google and for Mozilla and they got a lot of Gmail passwords. Uh, Iran had the same thing going for it with uh, DigiNotar, which, which was a Dutch company. Um, Syria did a really bad <laughs> SSL attack that was hilarious and failed, which was like really awful. But a lot of countries actually get it done. And the assumption is that the US can get it done very easily. Uh, and they, they get it done all the time, and it's really easy for them. It's really easy for a lot of people to get it done, to be honest. Like, I know just regular computer hackers who are moderate and skilled, who have like just you know happen to have access to two SSL certificate authorities that can generate any certificate they want. So it's a really like big unpatched hole in the internet that's like gaping wide and no one knows how to fix yet. So that those are the limitations which are extremely large of HTTPS. That being said, all these things are true, but HTTPS is still safer than than the alternative. That's all I can tell you. But it, 
using Tor and HTTPS, using Tor to access HTTPS websites. This is where you think comes in. It's a lot safer, and I'll show you how in a bit. Oh, okay. So, um, what's your name? Steve. Steve, like, reminded me of this really cool thing that I really should show you. Uh, it's the FF, right? Yes. It's, I'm sure it's the FF that made it. Can you give you the URL? Please. Uh, slash pages. I'm really glad you're sticking with me through so long. It really makes me happy because this is very important stuff and what you're learning today will help you a lot with your careers. So thank you. I really am glad that I'm uh, gathering your attention. Thank you. Okay. So this is a really nice graph made by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is my dream workplace. They're like the best international uh, internet privacy and security activist policy group in the world. They are heroes, and um, they support Tor. They really have done the, you should really donate to them, actually. They're like this amazing international organization. I apply for the internship every single year. It's, <laughs> but they usually take someone from MIT, or like Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> it sucks to be a Concordia, but, um, okay, this thing needs to be bigger. So I explained what Tor is and what HTTPS is. So this graph will show you what information Tor hides and what information HTTPS hides and what information is hidden when you use them together. This is you. You're connecting through a Wi-Fi. Does anyone have a laser pointer? I'm sorry, it's like a really weird thing to ask for. Um, this is a hacker that's also connected to your Wi-Fi at your home. There's a computer hacker in your home connected to your Wi-Fi or in the same net cafe or Starbucks. And you're both connected through the Wi-Fi to the ISP then the ISP connects to another ISP, and that ISP connects you to site.com, which is what you want to visit. Clear? This is, this is the graph we have. Over the way, we have a lot of potential listeners. There's the hacker, obviously. There's here at the ISP, your ISP, Rogers or Bell. There's the lawyer, the, 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 the lawyer for the ISP, the system administrator for the ISP, and uh, the law enforcement. And here, via surveillance uh, locations worldwide, the NSA might be listening, the NSA might be listening everywhere between your connection from this ISP to the other, and then this ISP connects to site.com, and site.com is a you know, business with its own sysadmin that runs the website, the lawyer that fends for the website legally, and law enforcement which talks to the lawyer and gets people arrested. So when we're not using Tor or HTTPS, we're going to HTTP, slash www.site.com. The hacker, it's too small to see and I can't enlarge it, but I'll just say what, what is happening. Um, is there like a ruler or something? Because my hand is getting in the way and you can't see anything. Uh, yeah, there's one just cleaned up by you over there. Oh, oh thank you, that's wonderful. So you're so Canadian, you keep apologizing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This is the <laughs> hacker. <laughs> um, cool. So the hacker can see that you're going to site.com. This is without Tor or HTTPS. He can see that you're going to site.com. He can see your username and password, any, any critical information that you type into the website. He can see your data and your location. If you're a journalist, you're logging into your email. If it, you're not using HTTPS, all of this is visible immediately. If you're talking to a source, you're compromising yourself and the source. You're, 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 you're fucking up majorly. And your ISP, all of them, this guy, this guy, this guy, lawyer, system, and police can see everything. The site you're going to, the sensitive data, and the location of both you and the website, your physical location through your IP address. Uh, the NSA can see just the same thing. The, uh, the website can see just the same thing. The other ISP can see just the same thing. All of them can see everything equally even like the random guy on your Wi-Fi, right? If you use HTTPS, the hacker can still see that you're going to site.com and can still see your IP address, but they can't see the information you're providing to the website, username, password, they cannot see that. Same thing for all these guys at the ISP, same thing for the NSA, except they can because they can hack into uh, HTTPS, but like assuming that 
this isn't done, which is also, you know, a fair chance it isn't done, but still likely it's being done if you're being targeted. It's hard to tell. ISP, they can only see that you're going to the website and, the, and your IP address, but they cannot see what you're typing. But as I said, HTTPS does not protect your data from the website itself. So the website obviously still sees the information that you're giving to it because it needs to to operate, right? You need to give the website your information. So clear? Do we understand what HTTPS does? Cool. Now, if we use Tor and HTTPS, The hacker can only tell that I'm using Tor and my IP address. But he cannot tell which website I'm visiting or anything else. Those guys can only tell my IP address that I'm using Tor as well. Only that I'm using Tor, except the exit relay, as I said, the exit, the end, the, the last Tor node can tell that I'm going to site.com, as I said before. But because you're using HTTPS, it's still encrypted even from that last relay. If you weren't using HTTPS, that last relay would still have your data, but not the relays in between, not the nodes in between in the Tor network, only the last node in the Tor network, the exit node is what it's called. Um, the ISP still sees, uh, wait, I should turn HTTPS back on, only that you're going to the website and that you're using Tor. Someone from around the world, I don't know who they are, that's what the ISP for the website sees is using Tor and connecting to this website, but I don't know who they, who they are, what information they're sending. The website actually knows. Site.com will know because they can, they can decrypt HTTPS for you. If you're using Tor without HTTPS, I already covered that the exit node will know a lot of your stuff, but otherwise, so will the ISP too. So usually with HTTPS, it was just those guys that see your data, but with Tor without HTTPS, the ISP and the exit node will also see your data. Any questions? So this is really important when you're browsing the internet. If you want to send an email to a source, you should use HTTPS and Tor. You should make sure that your emails are compartmentalized. You should make sure maybe to use an email service that has a record of, just a moment, a record of uh, being transparent and, have, and keeping people's privacy, preferably outside the United States. All these things are important. If you're doing research, if you want to access evidence that the source has sent you, which is, by the way, dangerous because uh, PDF files, flash, fi uh, flash movies like YouTube and so on, all of these are susceptible to attack. So like if, you, if, if a source sends you a file, say, hey, this PDF contains your next big scoop, it might actually be a backdoor, which is what happens actually in Syria. This is how people get infected in Syria, except they're not given stories. They're given the list of people that the Syrian government is looking for, which, by the way, opens an actual list, but also installs a backdoor. So it's really well cleverly disguised. Sometimes it disguises itself as Skype encryption programs, which is also, doesn't encrypt anything, quite the opposite, actually. Yes? Uh, for the computer completely illiterate amongst us. Uh, yeah, kaboom. Um, <laughs> can you enable HTTPS on... Computer illiterate detected. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, how do you tell if a website is using HTTPS? Do you just oh, I already said. Bar or, uh, you look here and you say if it says HTTPS. But how about if you're just clicking on the link or something, you can see it in the link? It says at the bottom HTTPS, okay. slash slash. I recommend really, okay, so the safest browser to use, yeah, what's going on? Uh, just, it, it'll, it'll stop. It, 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 we're not sure what the problem is. It's been making that noise for once in a while last week. It's a fax machine. It's a fax machine. Can someone at least close the door? Yeah, close that one. Cool. Someone close the door. Uh, I'm, I'm, um, so uh, in terms of browsers, unless you're using Tor, in which case Tor browser is the best browser, but if you're not, if you just want to browse regularly, I really recommend that you use Google Chrome. Um, I'm familiar with uh, browser security. I know how browsers are developed to a certain extent. I'm familiar with the development methodology and the way they're made and the security methodologies that they follow. And I'm much more confident in Google Chrome than I am with Firefox or any other browser in the world. Please use Google Chrome if you want to just for regular browsing. It's very secure, much more secure than regular browsers. Just wanted to put that out there. I don't work for Google or anything. I just really think it's a very well done browser. So, phew, that's Tor and HTTPS for you. I don't think I have anything else to say about Tor unless you have any questions. Are you sure? Because I'm going to move to something else if you don't. Yes? Do you use it all the time or do you just use it when you want to? I, um, no, I don't, I don't use it all the time. Um, frankly, like just because 
Like I operate within, like I use HTTPS all the time. I have a plugin called, uh, you can download a plugin for your browser. It's available for Firefox and Chrome as well. It's called HTTPS Everywhere. It was actually made by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, that, that foundation I just showed the website for. Uh, what it does is that it will detect, if you visit a website over HTTP, it will check if that website has HTTPS by default. And if it does, it'll direct you to it automatically. So that's good to install. Do I use Tor all the time? You can. A lot of people that I know do, and they, it's probably a good thing for them. I don't think it's a bad idea to do that. I just, I mean, my internet activities are mostly benign, and even if I'm being surveyed, I sometimes, like, I just, I don't think it's worth hiding. Like, I would rather not be surveyed, obviously, but, like, my internet life is pretty normal. I'm just a computer developer, and, like, if, 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 I, if I'm being surveyed, it's not really, like, a direct infringement on me. If I'm, for example, having a private conversation with my, uh, uh, friends, I would in fact uh, use Tor and OTR and so on, just to protect my personal privacy because I have a right to that. But otherwise, I mean, I hear some people have been using encrypted conversations for personal chats, but <laughs> yeah. I, I, I actually worked on an encrypt uh, encryption system and getting fan mail from like People like, we use this to like have cyber sex all the time. And I'm like, yes, I'm so glad my years of research have gone to the best use possible. <laughs> okay. uh, you mentioned though that all your data is viewable by the endnote, unless you're using HTTPS. <coughs> no, the endnote, the, the Tor endnote? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, so do you ever worry about that? Like, you don't really know who that is. Of course, yes. Yeah. All of these things are, are, I'm telling you, because yeah, they are things that you're super supposed to be worried about. But the thing is, there's no better alternative. This is the best we have. It's not perfect, it's far from perfect. That's really great because it means people like me can get more research funding in the future, but this is the best we have. Like, that's really the honest uh, situation. And that's why you need awareness training. That's why you need to tell people where the software ends a lot more and focused on that a lot more than what it does. I mean, Tor pulls off some impressive feats. There's a lot of incredible research behind Tor on protecting on anonymity, on very innovative anonymity and encryption techniques. But what's the point of covering those? The point is to cover the, 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 the limitations <coughs> and the failures, because those are the things that matter when, when people are using it. Cool. So I do not have iPhone or Android. So I have this shitty Nokia phone. But um, I won't be demonstrating the phone encrypted IM thingies. But I really recommend you <coughs> note them down and check them out later. Uh, plus, I don't need to because they're easy to use. Right, but I, I do have questions though on them, like how, so Chat Secure, for example, or uh, whichever and yeah. client. If I want to send a friend a text, so, so is that you for, use, is that for SMS? This one, uh, Gibberbot, is for IM. Like over, you can use it over Gtalk, but it'll encrypt everything over Gtalk. Yeah. So that even Google can't see what you're doing. So the nice thing with these is that when you use them, even the server, so with HTTPS, the server can see what you're doing, right? But when you use Gibberbot or Text Secure or Redphone or Chat Secure or Pigeon OTR or AGM OTR or CryptoCat OTR, even the server can't see what you're doing. No one can except the person you're talking to. The entire network cannot. So that's, that's a very important difference from HTTPS. <coughs> Do you need to exchange a key or? No, public key cryptography. So you, you, need to ex you need to authenticate fingerprints, which is something I'll get to. But in terms of exchanging keys, it's done automatically through a process called public key photography, yeah. which is really awesome. Yes? One question. Uh, is there any alternatives for BlackBerry, for example? I don't know. I'm sorry. I, uh, I wish uh, I, uh, I can send you an email later. Sure. Look it up. Yes? Does the other person need to be using the exact same program you're using? Or does they can depend. Some programs are interoperable. For example, any program that uses OTR is interoperable with the other. So CryptoCAD and Pigeon and Adium OTR all work across the board together. Um, Giverbot uses OTR, and therefore Giverbot is also compatible with these, with Pigeon OTR, Adium OTR, and CryptoCAD OTR, and so does ChatSecure. So Giverbot, ChatSecure, Pigeon, Adium, and CryptoCAD, as long as you're using OTR, the encryption plugin that comes for them, you can chat across the board. However, Text Secure uses OTR too, but it's for text messages, so it's not compatible. And Red Phone is a voice uh, chat, like you know, f regular phone calls thing. And OTR is only for text chat. It uses a protocol called ZRTP, which is different because it's for voice. Yes. Uh, so if I am calling somebody, he has to use Red Phone too. Yes. 
Yeah. Um, or any OTR yes. from this bunch. Yes. You cannot use a regular thing. And they cannot. It's protected. No. Okay. Yeah. If, uh, please, yeah, thank you. I can't forget, I can't believe I forgot to say that. Yeah, both people have to be using encryption clients. Like, encryption doesn't work one way. That's not all. Yeah, that's the thing. So there's no way to uh, send a text message to no. just a regular person. No. Right. No. Never. Ever, ever, ever. And if someone tells you, they're fucking with you. I, I don't believe that's possible right now. Um, cool. So as I said, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a smartphone. I'm getting one soon, but I don't have one right now. But I'm switching to uh, the desktop clients. So let me just clear something up here. Um, all of these use OTR, right? Pigeon, ADM, and CryptoCat. I personally work on CryptoCat. The reason why I'm not covering solely CryptoCat is because there's a bunch of things you have to be aware of when it comes to, the to these clients. The best Pigeon and ADM are desktop clients. They work on the desktop. They don't rely on a browser. Yeah. CryptoCat is much easier to use than Pigeon or ADM. Is there something? No, no. I just that's a film. I'll just wait. Is there? No, no. He's just substituted for Oh, okay. I'm taking. Um, so Pigeon and ADM are desktop clients and they don't rely on a web browser to work. However, they're more difficult to use. So you need to install Pigeon, uh, configure it, install OTR and configure it. And the other party has to have either Pigeon or ADM and configure OTR respectively. However, with CryptoCat, all you have to do is download a browser uh, app. You just install something in your browser and then you can join a OTR conversation immediately with anyone else using CryptoCat. But CryptoCat has only been there for two years now. Uh, I, I'm the developer for it. We've, we're open source software. We've been fully audited by uh, many, we've got research funding, we've been audited by many um, security researchers and so on, but it's only been there for two years. Those, Tor has been there for 10 years and it's still experimental security software, right? Uh, Pigeon and ADM have been there for probably just as long and people still find bugs every day. Now, I'm proud to say that with CryptoCat, the very last audit that we got, something very rare happened and they found zero bugs. They found absolutely zero vulnerabilities in the entire scope of their audit. That's extremely rare. Only Text Secure also got that. And uh, out of everything here, every, all, every single tool mentioned here. So that's really like cool. But as the developer of CryptoCat, I still have the responsibility to inform you that it's only two years old, even though we've got a lot of audits. But I, I will show you how to use all three just in case because uh, I have the ethical responsibility of not have a bias towards my own tool. But I fucking love CryptoCat and I use it all the time. Just saying. And I also got some stickers. stickers for everyone. Put them on your laptop. Give them to your friends. Mix them with your cereal. <laughs> Let them poke you in the eye. Lose your sight. Swallow on and choke to death. With CryptoCat, everything is possible. Shave the in the Give it to Oh, damn it, I missed your eye. <laughs> I don't even pay for these. They're free. I have funding. I don't care. <laughs> for a more like parabolic trajectory than that. <laughs> Wait, I think I have more. No, I actually don't. That's lame. Uh, another question from the back section? Yes. Can we get you a talk show? What? Can we get you a talk show? I had one. For a year. On CKUT? Yeah. No, we need to, you, you need to go on TV. Yeah. Uh, 
I'd much rather program and live the lifestyle of a stereotypical computer hacker. <laughs> so I'm already live streaming right now, so that's, you know, that's a thought. Oh, this needs to be on every day. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Nadim Show, where Nadim makes a fool of himself in order to educate people on internet privacy. Okay, so... <laughs> um, Oh, this works. Okay. Adium, because I'm using a Mac, right? I can't, sorry, I can't show you a pigeon, but it's basically the same thing. Uh, most of you are using Macs, which is very fortunate. Uh, all you have to do to use OTR over Adium is go to Adium, whoops, I'm going to close the door for now. Uh, go to adiumx.com. Actually, I think they switched it, sorry, adium.im, that's the old website. Adium.im. You can download Adium. Um, and it's like a much simpler process than um, Tor. You just download ADM, and then when you're chatting with someone over ADM, which I'm going to show you right now, uh, be careful. My ADM icon is different from the default icon because I customized it myself. The default icon is a duck, so if you get a duck, don't be uh, scared. Uh, I'm going to open like a friend of mine. Uh, I don't know this guy. I'm going to hide my buddy list because that's private. And um, you just right click click encryption, and then initiate encrypted OTR chat. And hopefully, if this friend I picked on random has OTR, there we go. Encrypted OTR chat initiated is what it says. Right? That's how easy it is in ADM. But you still have to have the other person using uh, either ADM or Pigeon and have OTR installed too and configured, right? In Pigeon, which unfortunately I can't show you, you download Pigeon from pigeon.im. You install it, very easy to install. I don't need to show you how to do it. And then you get the OTR plugin from um, cypherpunks.ca slash OTR. The guy who made OTR is Canadian, by the way. So that should be really cool for you guys. Uh, I'm, hoping <laughs> to, I'm hoping to be Canadian soon, but I'm not. Um, cypherpunks.ca slash OTR. <coughs> His name is Ian Goldberg. He teaches at the University of Waterloo. He's uh, one of the best cryptographers, in my opinion, alive today. Really amazing guy. You can just uh, skip all the talking here. Just go to downloads at the top. Uh, OTR plugin for Pigeon. You just download it. It's available for Windows. Windows installer for Pigeon. You double click it, you get an installer. You install, uh, you install it, installs easily. And then you go to um, the plugin settings in Pigeon and you turn it on. I'm sorry, I can't show you this. I don't own a Windows computer. Um, and now I'm gonna show you CryptoCAD. And also I'll, I'll, explain some, um, I'll explain some stuff as we go along with CryptoCAD about encryption and how OTR works and how this sort of encryption works and what, what the limitations are, obviously. So to download CryptoCat, please go to crypto.cat. You can download it in case you use Chrome. It works in Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. Um, I would suggest you use Chrome because we released a new version recently. It's not available for Firefox yet because it's being reviewed by the Firefox team. But, um, or it's also available for Mac too, but please focus on getting either the Chrome version or if you can't, any other version. Uh, it's supposed to be really easy to install, or otherwise we failed in our mission to make cryptography accessible. Um, please let me know when you have it installed. Just go to crypto.cat and click download CryptoCat for Chrome, or for any other browser. Does it work on smartphones? No. Do you know how many times I get this question every day? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's go to the Facebook uh, page for CryptoCat and check the comments for every single post. Like, I'll be posting about like pancakes and people are like, I want CryptoCat for iPhone. It's really, really that's so why, doesn't it? Sorry? So why not? I'm working on other stuff. I'm, uh, okay. It's, it's, it's coming in 2014. Is there is there a way that messages can stay in CryptoCat instead of like it being only chat? Like, very good question. There is, but we decided against it. Why? Very good reason. We clarified this reason very recently on the CryptoCat blog. Very recently, as in yesterday, I answered your question on the CryptoCat blog, and this is the answer. 
the story with the NSA broke out, right? And we learned that even though on the internet you're actually getting your content, when it comes to the phone surveillance system with Verizon, the contract that was leaked, the order, sorry, that was leaked, they're only getting your, or supposedly they're only getting your metadata. What is metadata? Metadata is circumstantial data. So in case of phone calls, they don't actually get the phone call content itself. They don't get the recording of the phone call. But they get the date of the phone call, the time of the phone call, who you called, what number you were using, your location during the time of the phone call. All of this information is called metadata. And it's very, like, they get it so en masse. They get every single US phone has its metadata recorded all the time. And all this circumstantial data can be used to build real information. When you have so much and when you're able to put it together, you're able to link all those bits of data together. You know, this guy called uh, this number from Times Square at 20 a.m., of uh, 8.20 a.m., and they had a seven minute long conversation, and then his location on his phone shifted from Times Square to, Man to Brooklyn. You know, like, all of this builds relationship data, and all of this is tangible surveillance. So the reason why a lot of features are absent from CryptoCat and I assume also from Tor, uh, although in a different way, is because we want to limit how much metadata we collect on our users. So we built this um, useful graph yesterday. Who has your metadata when you use CryptoCat? What metadata does the CryptoCat server have, uh, me, and what meta uh, although other people can set up their own CryptoCat servers. Uh, it's a public thing. So it's you know any CryptoCat server that you decide to connect to. And your internet service provider. Bell, Rogers, what information do they have? What metadata do they have? The, the name of your chat. Does CryptoCat get it? Yes. Your ISP does not. Your nickname, CryptoCat gets it. Your ISP does not. So I can see your nickname when you're chatting. You have to be aware of this. You don't have to trust me. You, you, you have to not trust me. Um, can I see that you're connecting to CryptoCat? I see a connecting IP address, yes. Your ISP cannot see that you're using CryptoCat if you use Tor. So that's, very, that's, that's an interesting thing. You can use CryptoCat over Tor. Um, the time your messages were sent, both of us, the ISP and me, the CryptoCat server, or someone else setting up a CryptoCat server, let's just say me so you're more scared, um, can, which is important, um, can see the time of the messages. I can see which nicknames you are messaging privately or having file transfers with. You can send files over CryptoCat. The ISP cannot. I can see your IP address, except, again, if you're using Tor, your ISP obviously knows your IP address. The contents of your conversation, CryptoCat cannot see the contents of your conversation because we use OTR and the contents are encrypted even from us, even from the CryptoCat server, and obviously your ISP also cannot. The contents of file transfers, same thing, but we can see the sizes of the file users you're transferring. We can approximate. We actually cannot get the precise size. And we can see the types of files, although your ISP cannot, so you've sent an image. I know that an image was sent. And see, this is really important because what if the CryptoCat server is compromised and then uh, the NSA, whoever compromised it, can see that uh, you know journalist X received an image from someone in New York. That's very serious. If that if, and if that journalist later leaks the image as like a big story, right? Because they know, except so obviously you take extra precautions. You use Tor, so both of your uh, locations and identities are hidden. CryptoCat does not hide your identity. So yeah. If you use Tor from here, what's to say that it doesn't connect from here, and thus they know that you're in Montreal? That would be like the shittiest luck ever. <laughs> okay. But um, I, I assume I assume that they have safeguards against that built into Tor. But I, I, I really like I don't think this is something that you have to be worried about. Although I, I really like I haven't considered this before, to be honest. But I, I, common sense tells me that they've probably looked into it. There. But it wouldn't really matter because they would know that you use Tor anyways, so they would assume that it's likely you're they, not. Really they are there. capable of knowing that you use Tor. Yeah. Right. So if if. If you're physically in Montreal, you use Tor, they know you use Tor, and, it, and your Tor exit knows It's funny because that would make it so that the last place there. they would look in is Montreal. Yeah. Because they would think, oh, that's what the Tor node is, so we have to yeah. go somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. That's that would be a real asshole thing to do, but it would really work, maybe. Yeah, that's, that's possible. That's really interesting. OK, so you know, that's just a short intro to the metadata. I'm glad I got to cover it. So did you all download CryptoCat? Cool. It works in your browser, as I said. So all you have to do is, in case you're using Chrome, wait, in case you're using Firefox, you get a, a little icon here that looks like the CryptoCat logo. 
on the top. This is Chrome, but if you're using Firefox, you let it here, and it looks like this. It looks like the CryptoCat logo, and you just click on it. If you're using Chrome, you open a new tab, you go to Apps here, and you have CryptoCat. So you just click on this, and it opens. This is CryptoCat. Uh, does everyone here have this screen? If you're using Firefox, you will get a slightly different looking screen because the, it's an older version. The update for Firefox will be released in a, in a couple of weeks. Everyone is here? Yeah. Come on, I'm talking my ass off. Yeah, 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 like, okay. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go into Super NSA Cuddles. So here we enter the name of the room, Super NSA Cuddles. And here we enter our nickname. So my nickname is Nadine. And then we press connect. CryptoCat takes a little time to generate the encryption keys, but meanwhile, it gives you an interesting fact about cats, so that you can wait. <laughs> but then uh, you log in, and this is the room that we're inside. We have Jackson, my name, blah, tick, and Obama. And Obama's being really informal for a US <laughs> president. <laughs> Hello. So right now, we're all chatting in a group conversation. This is encrypted. Um, yes, that is in fact the case. But um, here, this is the group conversation. Everyone inside the chat room can see what we're discussing. Here on the side, you can see the people in the chat room. And if you click on someone, I just switched to, so um, what, what nickname are you? Oh, I'm not, I'm not connected. My laptop's going to die. Okay, who's? I'm, I'm Obama. Are you using Chrome? Yes. Okay. So Obama just messaged me, and he says he's watching me. <laughs> um, I'm going to send him a cat. So all of the emoticons <laughs> in CryptoCats are cats, which is really cool. There's happy cat, sad cat, crying cat, disappointed cat, uh, Time cat, wing cat, extremely happy cat, <laughs> shy cat, surprised cat. Oh, I didn't implement that one. Okay. Whoops. No, actually, I did. It's this one. Surprised cat. <laughs> and um, yeah, so on. And so look, like, I go on about how CryptoCat is like fun and easy to use, but the thing with CryptoCat, what we're arguing, even on an academic level, is that usability and ease of use and accessibility are security features. Because if you don't have accessible, ease of easy to use encryption programs, even if they're new, even if they're experimental, people won't use them. And people will not use encryption software even when they need it. So a lot of people in my field think that we have to go extreme. We have to teach people how to use free BSD, you know, use extremely foreign systems. Um, and that otherwise you cannot achieve security. But my perspective in this is that you have to make those, you have to come to the journalists. You have to come to the people to which those systems would be useful. And even if we start um, with things that haven't been done before, even if there's a lot of work to do, it's still important because you end up, you end up reaching those people and you end up with them wanting to use something that works directly in their browser on every platform, wanting to use something that's friendly, that has, you know, like, so Obama, please send me a message. Just anything. <laughs> Audio notifications, right? So th these are things that are important because these are security features because it means that you will get people to try and learn and increase their security in the first place. Because if you start with something that's inaccessible, you won't get there. Um, so another thing you can do with CryptoCAD is you can send a file. <laughs> so. What's funny about sending files? Well, no, I, he said I have a drone. Like oh. if Obama said I, was, I was just wondering, like, no. sending files? <laughs> yeah, my so God. Funny. It's like okay. my favorite thing. Um, uh, so I might have overdone it with the sound effects. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to send a picture of, I don't know, this cat. So Obama's going to get the picture of a cat from me. There we go, that's the progress bar it's being sent. And he got it. Did you get the picture? Yep. Cool. Do you have a cat on your laptop? Is there a cat? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. So. <laughs> Hello.
Okay. I call up Barack on the phone, and I hear his voice. I know it's him, right? Hey, how's it going? I hear him. And he says, okay, can you tell me your encryption fingerprint? I tell him my own fingerprint. And then I ask him, okay, what's yours? And he says, 410E55. And if he says the same uh, numbers and letters I have on my screen, I know it's him. This is still problematic. What if someone has a gun to Barack's head, and he's telling him, read those fingerprints? He will still read them, and I will still think it's him, but it's not him. So it has, like, it fails at one point. But that's how you can verify their, their identity. Over the phone, over a medium where you already know who they are, over the phone, in real life, something already authenticated, because their phone, there's their voice, and you can verify who they are by exchanging fingerprints. You can access your own fingerprint by clicking here. So here on the top, you have a, you have a little menu. My info shows you your own fingerprint and group conversation fingerprint and so on. So, Barack, can you please go to my info and read me your fingerprint? I'm going to go to display info and see what his fingerprint is. It's a 410E5531. Cool. So you, ha you have to read the whole thing, usually, but we won't do that right now. Um, also, be careful. You don't read other person's, your fingerprint. You ask them, wait, no. No, you don't read other people their fingerprint. So I don't call Barack and read him Barack's fingerprint because then I'm messing things up. You ask people to read their own fingerprint to you. You don't do it the other way around. That's not how it works. In fact, if you do that, you will mess up the entire uh, authentication scheme. Easier ways to authenticate are coming soon. We're doing research on it. You'll be able to like, use it like a secret question thing. Like you'll ask Barack a question that only Barack knows. But that has to be done in a way that's like harder than it seems, believe it or not. You have to do like a whole cryptographic protocol thing for that to work properly in such a context. So that's CryptoCat, really. It's easy to use. You can use it with a lot of people at the same time. Any questions? Cool. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. Do you have to do that by phone? Like, could you message the person and be like, can you send me your fingerprint? No, because you still don't know who they are. Oh. They can send you their fingerprint. It can be Hugh Jintao pretending to be Barack Obama, yeah. and they can still send you the finger. They can just copy paste it. Mm -hmm. You have to use a method that's already authenticated. So over the phone, when I hear Barack's voice, I know it's him. Mm -hmm. I, I already know it's him. So when I hear him with his own voice telling me his fingerprint, I know that I'm talking to Barack, and I know it's Barack authenticating for himself. His, his voice is already something that I know and I trust. But I don't trust him the way he appears on CryptoCat. So when something I already trust, his voice, confirms his identity on something I don't trust, CryptoCat, I know it's him on CryptoCat. Right. If, like, let's say you had an anonymous source who wanted to be anonymous, like, completely. I just feel like the phone call, maybe... Oh, then you wouldn't call them. Yeah, exactly. So how would you get around that? Like, how would you verify... It's much harder. That? Uh, perhaps if, if you have never, like, talked to them before ever, it's probably impossible. But this is still something to be mindful for if you're talking to your friend, for example, right? It's yeah, not always yeah, that you're yeah. talking to an anonymous source or so on. Yes? Could you speculate as to how that the source in the U.S. got in contact with the individuals, or like how that something like that could have been done? Oh, I wish. I have no idea. Um, I don't know. I really like that. There's so many ways that he probably... So uh, an interesting thing about him is that he has a Tor sticker on his laptop, the source. Uh, uh, it, was, it was shown in a, mm -hmm. like a picture that was published. And so he probably used Tor. He has, a tour, he has a tour and an EFF sticker, Electronic Frontier Foundation sticker, the, 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 uh, the activist organization I showed, that shows how cool they are. So uh, you should donate to Tor, you should donate to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, they're really amazing. I mean, honestly, donate to the EFF more than Tor. Tor has like so much funding. Um, donate to the EFF. It's, I, I donate, I have a monthly subscription and I donate to them every month. They do amazing work. They protect people like you who are journalists. So please do that. Mm, I'm glad, and yeah, check out CryptoCat. Let me know if you like have bugs, go into bugs and you want to suggest features. Other than that, there's File Vault and TrueCrypt. Um, would you, do you want to cover File Vault or TrueCrypt? Do you still have time for that? Yeah. Do you want to go on? Yeah. Oh, excellent. I'm glad I managed to keep your attention for so long. That's impressive. Um, so, <sighs> For File Vault, it comes on your Mac, as I said. However, File Vault is proprietary, proprietary uh, encryption. 
So I, I don't know if it's completely broken or not. And don't forget, uh, Apple was part of the NSA <coughs> wiretapping thing that was going on, Prism. Apple was part of the, was one of the companies giving direct access to their network, to the NSA. And when you activate File Vault, uh, I, I already have it activated on this computer, uh, so I can't show you how to reactivate it. But when you activate, I'll show you the, the steps, but I can't show you this actual step that I want to discuss now. When you finish activating it, it'll send you, it'll ask you, do you want to back up your encryption key with Apple in case you lose it? And so if you do that, it goes straight to the NSA, and now we have whistleblower and that's what we're So don't do that. In fact, when you're using an encryption system, ask yourself this question. If I have this thing encrypted, and, I rem and I'm, I'm the only person who knows the password in my head, and I fall down, and I injure my head, and I get amnesia, and I forget everything, including the password. If you can still recover the password after that, after getting amnesia, then your encryption system is fine. It's screwed. Uh, so this, this is a, sorry. This is a um, um, very like cool way to test whether you trust something or not in terms of security. If you get amnesia and forget the password, if you can still somehow get the password back, it's not worth trusting, it's broken. Yes? The question about uh, CryptoCat. So I use CryptoCat you know, to, to uh, the login earlier, Pirate One. But uh, when I use Tor, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't oh. show me the conversation. That's, yeah. I, I blame that on Tor, yeah. to be honest. Like, Tor sometimes is really slow, sometimes it's unreliable. Not in terms of security, but in terms of usability. Mm -hmm. And that's how Tor is. Yeah. Like, Tor has a lot of usability problems. And to be honest, like, it achieves a lot in terms of security, so it's not really that bad. Mm -hmm. And it's impressive that they've gone so far while even making it slightly usable right. with all the security it gives you. But that's how it is. You just have, when you're using Tor, you have to sometimes sacrifice some uh, speed, some usability, and there's no other way around. Mm -hmm. So, have you got it tested before and it worked with Tor? I do. I do test it with, but that, even I sometimes run into these problems, and it's and it's not just me. Like any other, yeah. any other protocol, any other program also will have these. Sometimes, it, sometimes yes, sometimes it depends on your work. It depends on what nodes you're going through. It depends on the stress on the network at, the, at a given time. If there's a revolution happening in Egypt, for example, you're gonna have a lot worse time with yeah. the Tor. Um, there's a very interesting graph actually that shows. So let me show you something really cool. These are metrics kept by Tor that shows how many people are using Tor all over the world. Let's look at Egypt. Let's go back to 2010. So this is Egypt, Tor usage from 2010 until today. Look at this spike. It's in January 25, 2011. What happened in January 20, 25, 2011 in Egypt? The Arab Spring. So this is why, look, you can actually plan, you can plot revolutionary activity in Egypt according to Tor usage. You do a stun in uh, Turkey today? Maybe. I don't, uh, the last time I checked it wasn't the case actually, but I'll check again. And I'll limit the time frame to something more sensible. Hmm? Yeah. Slightly. Yeah. It's not as dramatic as Egypt though. But then again, the protests in Turkey are not as dramatic as the protests in Egypt. In Syria, it works. I, uh, and, but Egypt, to be honest, I, I will admit that Egypt is the most dramatic example. Um, another thing that I wanted to show with Egypt. It fell down to below the average. Because immediately after, people started using Tor en masse. The Mubarak regime cut off the internet entirely, almost entirely, except for dial-up. So it fell down to way below the average even a year back, mm. right? And that's, um, Iran, Iran. Yeah, same thing with Iran. Green Revolution. Did you uh, No, actually, wait, the Green Revolution was not in 2012. Sorry, no, 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 whoa. Yeah. Um, was it even? Was it even before? I think it was 2009. It was no, Iran or not 2009? Iran. Maybe late 2010? I think there were elections by the end of the year. I forget. It's definitely not this. 
but you can also see like spikes in Tor, then internet censorship cuts off the entire internet, and then it resumes. Or they block Tor. Uh, Tor is completely blocked in mainland China as far as I know. I, I think this is the case. So it is possible for people, for governments to block Tor. Everything I've discussed today will never protect you at all from governments. I have not helped you in any way. So use it, but be terrified. Because the best we have is not enough. And uh, somehow we still managed to get funding for it. So good on us, but good luck <coughs> for you. Um, that's really like the, the most honest thing I can tell you. Like just really, this will make you safer, but only barely. None of this is safe from the NSA, not even Tor, which is supposed to be like the crown jewel of internet privacy. And yes? But, uh, well, that's common. Most of us are dealing with government sources and whistleblowers. So what you just said makes me think, well, I have to do the old fashioned way. What's the old fashioned way? Parking lot. <laughs> I am not an expert in that kind of security, so I don't. I, I do not have the professional capacity to advise you when it comes to those sort of things. What if you're sourcing another country? No, you just say governments. You just said you just say governments. We're, we're unprotected. This doesn't help us with uh, governments. So I'm just saying. Well, most of us deal with we overturn stories. Has a lot to do with governments. My duffy was overturned by uh, an email uh, from a former journalist. So how do we we use this for our personal use or in and out communications between journals? Or I'm just trying to figure out what how, you well, use how it for everything. You, you can use it for everything, uh, except where obviously, like, you can, if you can meet up with someone privately and you can have them write it down on a piece of paper and then burn the piece of paper afterwards and shut off your cell phones the entire time. And like even heck, you can like shave off your all of your hair and your eyebrows and like wear clean clothes and like cut off all your toenails and right. you know like all this and like wear gloves and a hat so that no hair falls out and like you know burn off your fingerprints with acid. Then like that would probably be really secure. But uh, in case you cannot do that, then this is still if if you are stuck with the internet. And in terms of physical security, I don't know what your physical circumstances are, and I don't know how to, how to advise on that. That's not my field. But in case you are stuck with the internet, for better or for worse, this is the best you have. That's, that's all I can say. <coughs> Do you have any questions? Do you want a sticker? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the Lake newspaper for dealing with me. You can access. Uh, you can send me an email later. I will probably not reply for weeks. But, um, um, you mentioned earlier about using secure um, email. Um, oh, we didn't get to that. Yeah. So sorry, I'm tired. Okay. But, uh, you can use uh, something. Just Google something called PGP. PGP. It's the okay. hardest thing to use, though, by far. That's why I didn't get to it. Okay. Like, it's even harder than Tor. Okay. So. Well, not with Thunderbird, right? With Thunderbird, it's really easy. Yeah. But you're using Thunderbird. You should try teaching PGP <laughs> with Thunderbird. It's like the my least favorite thing to cover. I hate it. Mm -hmm. But like, it's easier. But like, I still hate it. Yeah. Uh, just maybe if you could give it like a brief explanation, I'm going to be setting up a new email account tomorrow. What do I need to know to present that email account? <sighs> okay. So if you're setting up an yeah. internet account tomorrow, dude, I'm exhausted. I just, yeah, I'm no, no, no. If you want, if you want, I can send you an email about it. Later. Yeah, we'll talk later. Sorry. Just Google PGP. Great. Well, thanks. 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 Don't be intimidated by surveillance. Stand for society. Break the best stories ever. Make Edward uh, what? Snowden, Snowden. <laughs> look like not so cool in front of the sources you will break when you're all grown up and stuff. So yeah, be good journalists. Be like Grant Greenwald.